Well, good afternoon. This is COP621 Web Security. Uh, Well, today we're going to talk about cross-site scripting uh, and several other topics. Before we get started, does anybody have any questions about I'm sure we've covered or any of the recorded lectures? Anybody actually look at the recorded lectures? Are you referring to the ones on Blackboard or? Yes, the, the, one, the, the YouTube ones, the ones that are listed on Blackboard. Yes, I listened to them and watched them. Oh, yeah. well, I'm glad somebody did. Okay, well, uh, that's fine. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, always let me know. All right, so today I've got a lecture along with several live demonstrations that hopefully will be easy and uh, not give me any trouble. Uh, uh, Zoom is giving me some trouble, but that's okay. Uh, okay, so moving right along, maybe. Uh, all right, uh, in this class, there are about five learning objectives. Uh, two of them are listed here. Uh, as you may note, uh, both of them deal with known vulnerabilities or common vulnerabilities. We're supposed to secure websites and kind of protect them from known vulnerabilities. And another one is to perform penetration testing. That is, learn if you can attack a website successfully uh, in order to test it its security uh, and you attack it with the vulnerabilities that are known. And so throughout this class, we're gonna be looking at several known vulnerabilities. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of them out there, uh, quite a list if you go out and look. The Open Web Application Security Pro Project or OWASP uh, is an organization that works to improve the security of software, in particular web applications. And they're a great site for finding information about uh, securing websites. And I've used them a lot and I've used them uh, a lot for information on this lecture. So later on, we'll see uh, OWASP uh, top 10 and OWASP solutions to things. And I, of course, copied it from the website OWASP.org. So if you wanna find something about web security, in my opinion, that's the best place to look. Okay, so thinking of OWASP, OWASP keeps track of the errors uh, that occur, the, the, the threats uh, that are out there and uh, ranks them. They have the OWASP top 10. Those are the 10 most uh, dangerous or most common mistakes that they find in web applications. Uh, so let me just briefly go down these and then we'll start talking about one of them. Uh, these are in the order that OWASP puts them, but is not necessarily in the uh, order of most prevalence. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, there are 10 of these, of course, injection being uh, sneak, sneaking in data, and uh, untrusted data, so it is interpreted. And we'll talk about that today, one aspect of that, but there are several aspects. They can be cross-site cross -site scripting or command injection or several different versions of injection. And then broken authentication. Uh, that is when you log into a website, either using your user ID and password, whatever system you're using, it's not always implemented correctly. And that's another major problem. Uh, sensitive data exposure. Things are sent across the web and often not protected as they should. That was the assignment for last week. Uh, that was due about two hours ago. Uh, you were supposed to go out and find information that was sent across the web and then say, oh, I know that and use it later. Then there are some problems with XML and XML shows up all over the place. Uh, so you can put links in XML to other sites and that can cause a security problem. So XML external entities. Uh, broken access control, uh, properly, not properly restricting what users can do. Uh, security misconfiguration is a very broad one, but a very common one. And it's when people are just not setting the security configurations. 
The biggest and worst misconfiguration is not changing the default password for the administrator. You wouldn't believe how many sites still have the default password for the administrator. It's not hard to guess. Uh, <clears throat> number seven there is cross-site scripting. That'll be the topic for today. Uh, number eight is insecurity serialization. Uh, when you send the objects across the web, particularly like Java objects, there are a bunch of problems that can occur when you send them or when you get to the other side and you uh, try to reconstitute a flattened object. Uh, and then uh, a lot of programs or web applications are built using a variety of frameworks and packages. Uh, and a lot of these, like, uh, jQuery or Boot or some of the others, and some of these have known vulnerabilities. If you're using an old version of that, it may have well-known flaws. Uh, that's why you want to keep up with the latest versions. And then insufficient logging and monitoring. That gets along with my uh, big problem I have with student programming or anybody's programming, is people tend to ignore error messages. A function or something will return a status, which could tell you whether it worked or doesn't work. And they'll ignore the status. They just assume that it worked and don't do anything about it. Uh, in web applications, generally one would log any errors. One of the problems, of course, is people log these things and nobody looks at the logs because they're kind of boring and who wants to see anything? They don't look at the logs and then months later, and you can see here, time to detect the breaches over 200 days. Well, that means that it was in the log, but nobody noticed there was a problem or there was a problem, but it was subtle. It was hard to notice in the logs. Here's a chart I took from Positive Technologies that ranks the uh, top 10. Well, actually it ranks the top eight, I guess. Uh, and you can see that security misconfiguration is up there. 84% of the sites that they checked had some form of security misconfiguration. 53%, or about half of them, had some cross-site scripting problems. Uh, and then, a broken authentication was next. You can see broken access control and so forth down to XML external entities, which only 5% of the sites made that mistake. Uh, now, I don't believe OWASP colors them or ranks them high, medium, and low, but positive technologies did. And you can see that uh, some of the most common ones aren't are only kind of medium problems. Was, yeah, they're a problem. They, generally had a real big problem uh, if you have it. Whereas say broken authentication, not only does it occur about half the time, but it can be a really serious flaw. Okay, uh, we talked about this last time, but just one, one slide to go quickly over, how does a web application work? Well, okay, it runs, because it's a web application, it runs in the web browser and uses uh, web servers. The uh, Okay, so you go and you get a web page uh, and it downloads the HTML or the web page which has HTML and JavaScript in the browser. And then on the server side, there are there's some sort of program running and that could be in a variety of languages, most commonly uh, JavaScript or PHP or Java. Uh, and you can also have like C programs or any other compiled languages can do that too. And then you might have a database, SQL, some form of SQL being the most popular. Uh, some students like to use non-SQL databases. I think those are mostly the students who did very poorly in the SQL class. Okay. Anyway, so you've got some sort of form looking at you and the user enters some sort of data in the form and presses the, the okay button. And the JavaScript picks up the data off the form and ships it out uh, over to the server. The server does something with it. It looks at the data, uh, maybe looks in its database for some information, does some processing, whatever it is that the program is supposed to do, and then ships the result back across the internet to the client browser, often using JSON or XML. In other words, we're, we're just sending data there and getting data back. We're not doing a whole web page refresh. We're just uh, getting some information, which will then display on the original web page. And the JavaScript gets that data and displays it in the browser. browser. That's your typical application. 
Okay, so here's a, an example. We have a paragraph. Uh, the paragraph has an ID and uh, called thing. Thing is just a name. You can give it whatever you want to. And the text of the paragraph is mom and apple pie. And then uh, later in some script that might be executed at some time, we go out and we get the uh, paragraph. We search for it based on the document object. The document, of course, is the root of the DOM tree. It is an object that represents the entire document. And we call the get element by ID method on it, searching for something that has the ID thing. And of course, that paragraph that says mom and apple pie is the one, returns that object. So then we have that object. And the inner HTML property of that object specifies uh, what, what the HTML is. Right now it's mom and apple pie, but we're going to change that. And we'll change it to uh, evil and corruption with some uh, emphasis tags around the word evil. Okay, so that runs, uh, uh, that changes the information in the uh, tag. Now, uh, the, the flaws we want to talk about today, the threats, uh, we're talking about that in several other threats, multiple threats are the result of improper use of untrusted data. An awful lot of these web attacks are come from untrusted data. And untrusted data is data that comes from some source outside the application. In other words, it's not created in the program. It's created from someplace else, typically from user input. In other words, user types in something, and now you've got a string that the user types in. Consider that string to be untrusted. You don't know what's in that string, so your application shouldn't trust it. Now, of course, if you have a string with a constant in your program that you created, we can trust that. But if it came from a user, you can't trust it. Also, there are other places you might find untrusted data. Uh, it can be pulled off a database. Who knows how it got there? And also, uh, cookies. Sometimes the cookies have information that shouldn't necessarily be trusted. And so, uh, you should always treat untrusted data as if uh, it has an attack in it. That is, don't trust untrusted data. That's why we call it untrusted data. And untrusted data can move through applications. So it can be split into pieces, stored in separate strings or st numbers, and then combined in different forms with trusted information to come up with a, uh, some value, which still is untrusted. Basically, untrusted data with trusted data results in untrusted data. It does, adding trusted data to it does not clean it, just makes everything dirty. Uh, and so basically the whole flaw of untrusted data is you try to get some interpreter, a JavaScript interpreter or some interpretive system to try to interpret the data and then interpret it as commands. And that's the big problem with untrusted data. Uh, Cross-site scripting is the topic for today, usually abbreviated XSS. Uh, and so cross-site scripting occurs when your browser tries to execute or parse untrusted data. In other words, you, ent you or somebody, an attacker has entered data into the system and the system failed to protect itself against this data and then uh, goes out and tries to use that data as a, in a way that causes it to be interpreted. In other words, typically JavaScript or some other form of interpreter, an SQL database tries to interpret the data. Happens a lot. You can see they've attacked, people have attacked a variety of well-known websites like Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, YouTube, those are well-known sites. They've all been hit before. Uh, of course, part of the problem pretty much occurs because your web page mixes up your text, the information that's supposed to be displayed, formatting information about how and where it's supposed to be displayed, and script programmable, executable parts of the code. It's all in the same page. And so the whole concept of cross-site scripting is trying to fool the browser into interpreting the text that was entered. Okay, now just to make this a little exciting, I have a poll uh, for you. So 
Uh, hopefully you can see the poll. Somebody tell me you can see it. Okay, somebody's answered, so you must see it. Well, yeah, I can see it. Great, okay, well, uh, and give it a shot. Okay, still a couple of people who haven't answered. Anybody else want to quick make a guess? Well, so, oh, got another person. Okay, well, all right, you can get the next poll. There'll be more. Uh, those of you who had other classes with me, particularly live classes, know I like response clickers. This is my answer to response clickers. So, end of that poll. Let's uh, share the results with everyone. You can see that. Uh, Yes, 71% of you that has at least one security flaw. I think that's a pretty safe bet. I don't know if they're riddled with security flaws. A whole bunch of them have more than one flaw, but you can bet with the, if you go back and look at the uh, prevalence of things, uh, one of them was 85%. Well, if 85% of the sites have that flaw, you can bet that most sites have at least one flaw, possibly more. Uh, I don't think you're wrong to say they're possibly riddled with security flaws. Okay, so that's enough of that, that problem. Uh, all right, back to cross-site scripting, which I hope you can see. Uh, okay, give it a little example here. Uh, imagine you get a website, it's gonna ask you for some information, it's gonna ask you for your name, and then the website will send it across uh, to a PHP program called My App on the browser. And this is how it might be sent. Uh, we've got the uh, username equals query, which is the text from the, uh, that the user has entered. Okay, and then the server sends that back with a little message. And we put this in the web page, replacing a paragraph or adding a paragraph. So now it says hello in the name that it got. That's if you entered your name. What if you entered script? What if you entered JavaScript? And so when it came back, it might uh, execute something. Okay. Uh, here's an example program. I've got a bunch of these little example programs I would like to try for you. Uh, take a quick look at this one. This one is very simple. You can see that's the whole thing. Uh, I guess it starts down here with some input uh, where ask the user's name and it's gonna be an input that's gonna be a text box. And when you type something in on change, it's gonna call the show name function up at the top. It's got a name and a bunch of other things. Okay. And then the show name is pretty simple. We simply get the name that the user, we get the document ID in stuff. In stuff is this input text field. Uh, and then uh, get the value that user entered, call that user input, and then rewrite the web page saying hello user input. So, uh, okay, these things are uh, estimate, please. Okay, hope you can see this. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you. There, okay. There is a uh, the web page. That's the program that you saw just a minute ago uh, running. Uh, okay, and we'll just try, we'll try my name. Okay, we'll just type a name in and it goes, hello, Fred. Well, that's what we expected it to do. But what if we're not so nice? What if we uh, type in something like this? Oh, by the way, uh, Swedish prime minister or the past Swedish prime minister, I was looking for a name that had a non-English character in it. So, and it's got the script and the alert, and we type that in, oh, lo and behold, look at that. The script was executed uh, and it created a pop-up alert box and it gives the name and it said, okay. So instead of just typing in our name, we typed in some script and hello. Oh, you know, if we did that again, we could just type in uh, red and then our script and then it would work. We still get the pop-up box 
and it would say, hello, Fred. So in this case, of course, the script that executed was very obvious intentionally because this is an example, but it could have been scripted to something much more subtle. Uh, and we'll reset this again. Now I have some examples here where I uh, talk about encoding things, but there's the uh, brackets have been removed and replaced with singles. And now, now the script uh, is displayed as you'd expect it to be, but it wasn't executed. In other words, by uh, encry or encoding the symbols, the less than the greater than symbol and all the others. So, is everybody seeing this, the uh, program run? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, cool. we can see it. Okay. Um, you know, I can't always tell what you're seeing. Uh, so good. All right. So the system works. Hey. Uh, so that's my example. Any questions about the example? There is the code. Uh, it's pretty simple, but that's why. Okay. Yeah, I tried to make it as simple as I could. All right. Now, there are several ways you can try to uh, keep the input clean, make sure that you get what you want and don't get what you don't want. In fact, that's what's going to take up the next hour. Uh, okay. Now, if you're running HTML5, and particularly everybody's running HTML5, uh, you can specify constraints for the input field, and those will be supported by uh, Java. In other words, if you don't follow the constraints, uh, the browser will check it and give you an error message. Uh, there's several, there's a whole bunch of them. Since this is not a uh, web application development class, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to go over some of them that are important to protecting the, a web system. Uh, some of the ones that we don't care about too much is we said type equals text in the previous example. Uh, this is, if you say type equals number, well, then you can specify the smallest value or the largest value you want. You can even specify whether the number is supposed to be evenly divisible by another number. Hey, I'm not sure why you'd want that, but it's, it's a specification you can make. You can specify if the input is supposed to be a URL or an email address. That is, if you're saying that this is an email address, expect it to look like a valid email address. It's going to want an at sign in the middle and a, uh, a domain on the right and a name on the other. But it will check for that. Uh, now, for a text input, the biggest thing you can, the best thing you can do is to specify a regular expression pattern defining what its acceptable input. <clears throat> Hopefully, people know what regular expressions look like. Uh, I was not intending to show you how to use regular expressions. If you don't know how to use regular expressions, uh, spend 15 minutes on the web and find a regular expression tutorial and figure it out. They're pretty simple. Uh, okay, so with uh, the regular expression, but you can pretty well catch a lot of the uh, improper input that you want. You can test for the validity of this. Now, it's important to note that if you specify a particular pattern that you want, it doesn't mean that you'll get an error message and reject the input immediately you have to test for it. In fact, going back to our previous web page, you see down here at the bottom, it has this pattern statement that defines how the input should look like. Didn't do anything because we didn't check it. You have to check it. There are a couple uh, methods you can use to check it. So you can, uh, for the particular element you wanna check, and of course you have all sorts of elements you can check the validity on. In this case, it would have been an input field. Uh, so we find that element, you know, Get, uh, you know, get element by ID or whatever it is. Once you have the element, then you can call check validity on it. And check validity returns true or false. If the uh, input follows all the rules that you specify, particularly if you have a regular expression, or this also works, of course, for numbers too big, too small, if it follows all the rules, then it returns true, saying, yes, the input meets all the validity checks that you specified. If, though, doesn't meet the input type, it, uh, it returns false. And it fires an invalid event in case your program is capturing invalid events. If you are, you'll get it. Otherwise, well, you'll ignore it. Uh, it does not, by default, print any error message. It simply responds true or false. The very similar method, report validity, does the same things as check validity, but also if the message, uh, excuse me, if the input is 
incorrect, it will display an error message on the screen of the browser telling the user that something is not right. Here is an, another example. It's almost the same as the previous example, uh, but I have uh, a couple of checks again. We have at the bottom, you can see the pattern It's setting a regular expression. And basically what the regular expression in this case means, we've got square brackets in here with a plus sign. The plus sign means uh, one or more of these things. You know, repeat this multiple times. What's in the middle? It's the letters A through Z. There's a space here and lowercase a through Z. So that means the input can contain the capital letters, the lowercase letters, or a space. If you leave the space out, then you can't, uh, then spaces are not allowed in the input. It doesn't work well. In my case, it doesn't work well. Okay, so that's the pattern. And then up here in the show name, we've added an if statement. If input field, input field goes, we got the uh, input element, we can document get element by ID in stuff, where in stuff is the ID of the uh, input field. And we got that. So input field is, well, the input field. And then we called report validity on it. Uh, and it returns true or false. So uh, if it's true, then uh, we're going to get the input. Uh, we're going to then say hello. Otherwise, it's going to print, it's going to display the message bad input. We've added an output field here. So let's give it a shot. Uh, uh, there it is. That is the program. Uh, let's make it so you can see it. Oh, okay, good enough. See that without your spectacles. All right, so this is the program that we are seeing here. This has got the, uh, the check in it, the only difference in there. And where is that? So we'll go back to that. And let's just enter, let's just enter a name. Fred Smith. Uh, we have two Smiths in the class. You may know a Smith. Uh, hey, okay, it worked. The input was valid and it just displayed it. But now let's go find some invalid input. I just so happen to have some invalid input. Uh, let's try my favorite attack. So we'll put that there and hit it. Oh, bad input. Please match the requested format. The, method, the message is rather generic because uh, I didn't specify what I wanted to check for, except the uh, pattern. By the way, I did notice in my testing that if I just type the, oh, the rhyme minister, the prime minister, uh, it doesn't like that because it doesn't like that character. If I take the character out, it works fine. I'm not sure how to specify that, but, uh, but you can figure it out. Uh, so yes, it detects bad input in this case, Saves you from bad input. All right, any questions about that? We'll uh, go back to the slides. Uh, yes, so that's an example of checking the input and using the uh, input constraint API uh, to catch invalid input. All right, then, now, so this, helps you from entering scripts into your browser so you don't attack yourself. Uh, it may not be particularly clear immediately what kind of advantage that is. Uh, well, there are three, maybe four, different types of uh, cross-site scripting attacks. Uh, and one of them is the non-persistent or the reflected attack. Uh, and that's the most common type that you'll see. Uh, uh, imagine, of course, the standard application where you type in some information, it goes out to the server, the server does some massaging on it and sends it back to you. Uh, and then it may display some of the information that was sent to the server. A good example is if you're doing a query, say you're gonna do a search in Google or something. Uh, when you type in the words you're searching for, it goes out to Google, when Google displays, uh, all the stuff it found, it also displays your query, just like you entered it in. Uh, now, Google's smart enough to know better. It won't let an attack get through. 
But uh, yes, so if you put it in a tech, it would try to display it there. So if you did a search like this, where you go some script and put some bad stuff in the middle, yes, that would send it back. That would go to the server. The server would look for uh, some match, oops, sorry. Uh, and then uh, bring it back. And the web page that returned with results would show the, uh, the query and the query would be the script that could be executed. Uh, and therefore, uh, it could be attacked. Now, how do you make any value of it? Again, are you still attacking yourself? Well, you could send uh, a link to somebody with, uh, with an attack in it. Here's an example I stole from Wikipedia. I try to steal from the best. Uh, okay, we've got Carol, Carol and Bob and, and Aaron, Alice. Alice and Bob, by the way, if you haven't figured out now, in any sort of security uh, text uh, or journals, Alice is always sending a message to Bob and somebody else. The third person varies, but Alice is sending a message to Bob and somebody else is trying to get him. So in this case, Alice wants to use the Bob site, Bob site, Bob site org, and uh, But Carol wants, Carol knows that Alice likes Bob's site and logs in frequently. Has it, you have to log in to Bob's site, you know, but Alice has a user ID and password. And of course, because the, the servers are stateless, the user's identification and the fact that they are authorized is kept in their cookies. So when the server sends information back to the browser, it sends them a cookie. And then that browser sends that cookie back to the server next time they go to that server. Uh, this all happens in the HTTP, you don't see it, but it's always there. But if you're using cookies, it's always there. And so Alice is gonna, or Carol is gonna go out and get Alice. So she creates this uh, link and you can see it goes to bobsite.org on the search function because it's gonna make a search. Uh, and we're going to search for puppies because we know Alice likes to look. But we'll put it out there with a title, cute puppies. Uh, I might note that when you put a link in email or on a web page, you can specify the text that's going to appear on the screen. And it doesn't in any way have to match the uh, URL that you're going to connect to. Typically, you'll say something like cute puppies, and the URL will be what you see here. or They'll say click here, H E R E. Uh, but sometimes a really nasty site will display the URL, but that's not the URL where you're going. You're going to someplace else trying to fool you. Anyway, so let's look at this URL. We go query puppies, and then we have some script. In addition to the word puppies that we're going to search for, we have some script. And the source that we're going to get the script from, the script is not here, is we're going to go out to this website, which we assume Carol controls, the evil site and get authorization stealer.js, a JavaScript file. And so she puts this in an email with the title, cute puppies. And knowing that Alice likes puppies, she's gonna click on the site on the link sent to her by Carol. And so it's gonna go out there. It's gonna to go to, you know, Alice will see it go to Bob's site, uh, Bob's site or, and then it will return the query and the script. So when the result comes back, should probably come something like uh, no matches because it's trying to match puppies script evil website uh, uh, no nothing nothing found which Alice will go hmm that's funny I thought there'd be cute puppies on this website meanwhile in the background while she's not watching uh, we've got this uh, JavaScript running and the JavaScript can do interesting things like grab the cookies the last time we talked about uh, JavaScript can access the cookies. Actually, it wasn't last time, but it was in one of the recorded lectures. You can get the cookies and then ship them off to Carol. Now that Carol has the cookies that specifies that she's Alice and that she's authorized to use the website, all she has to do is go out to the website with the cookie and she's Carol. Carol is now goes on there and appears as Alice on that website. And so she's there. I don't know if she's going to buy anything from Bob's site, but she charge it to Carol. Okay, so that was a non-persistent attack. Now there's persistent attacks and they're even worse. A persistent attack is a stored. In other words, you store the uh, evil script someplace and then users get it later on. 
So uh, basically, the uh, user input is sent off to a server, which wants to get data from the user and store it away. It's asking for the user's name. A perfect example is a messaging board. You're sending messages to everybody. So you type, it expects you to type in a message, which it puts into its database. And then when people want to see your messages, it, it uh, looks, you know, the database looks for them and displays all the messages it has. But it may be that the message you typed in doesn't just have text, it has script in it. It can have a uh, JavaScript so that when that JavaScript is then sent back to uh, another user who thinks they're gonna be seeing the message from your page, gets the JavaScript, the message displays, but it also executes the JavaScript and who knows what that JavaScript is going to do. Probably not anything nice. Uh, uh, one of the big impacts of this type of attack is you can get a lot of users. In other words, if you go to a popular site and you put uh, some nasty stuff out there, that you think is going to be accessed by many people, you know, hey, I get just thousands of hits from everything I enter. Ooh, so go through. So in some sense, also, not only can you do that, but you can propagate what you, the JavaScript you sent down there can copy stuff to other websites. Ooh, what other websites is this people accessing? You go out and put the information out there. And then there's the DOM, the main object model uh, based or the or a local. This one doesn't use the server at all. It's what I showed you earlier, where information is entered in the web page and then the JavaScript then displays it in the web page. There are several reasons why you might want to do this. Uh, and of course, once again, if you stick JavaScript in the input, uh, it might be uh, displayed in the user. Now, this can be either a person persistent or non-persistent. Uh, the simple ones I had today, I showed you, were uh, non-persistent, but you could store the data in a cookie or in local variables, and so it shows up later on. All right, there are uh, several things you can do about these. Again, I mentioned the OWASP.org website, a really good site for finding information about how to keep your applications safe. There is a series of websites, uh, cheat sheets. Uh, go to cheatsheets.owasp.org and it has a table of contents for lots and lots of uh, possible problems. And we'll be covering only, we're gonna cover about half a dozen of them, but there's three or four dozen out there. Uh, so uh, you can take a look at those. I was looking at the one today for preventing cross-site scripting. Uh, now uh, I have another poll. So uh, let's try this poll. This is my equivalent of a clicker question. So please respond. Okay, about two thirds of you answered. Oh, Dorian's decided to turn off his camera because we we're looking at his. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, okay, so if everybody would click, I'll give you five more seconds. It's one whole minute. All right. Then some of you have fallen asleep, but that's that's okay. And there we are. Let's take a look at how people thought. All right. The most popular answer is all of the above. Unfortunately, that's not the right answer. Uh, a persistent cross-site attack is stored on a server, uh, which nobody clicked. Uh, impact many users at once. That would be a, mostly a persistent one. So, uh, and of course, so persistence, this is a non-persistent, so it's not the first answer, it's not the second one. It does execute user data. Almost all the cross-site scripting attacks involve ex executing or interpreting user data or untrusted data. So the third answer, 
execute user data is correct. Any questions about that? Somebody think I'm trying to fool you? Well, I was. I've noticed that if on a multiple choice question, if you put all of the above, a lot of people will pick it. I'm so mean. Okay. All right. So enough of that. Continuing on. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So OWASP has a series of rules for how to protect your site against cross-site scripting. And here is, well, it's not the first rule, it's rule zero. Rule zero says, don't ever put untrusted data in your web page unless you follow the following rules. So this is the null rule or the rule that says, if it doesn't follow any other rules, don't put the untrusted data in your web page. Not here, not there, not in the JavaScript, not in the cross, not in the uh, cascading style sheets, not in attributes, not in data. Okay, just don't put untrusted data anywhere. Except there are about half a dozen rules that I'll go over. Okay, rule number one. Uh, you can put it in an HTML entity, uh, but you want to HTML encode the data first. In other words, if you just put it raw, like with the bracket script bracket, that's gonna cause some problems. But if you can HTML encode it, then if you're just putting it as data, now this isn't like in a paragraph or a table, that's fine. We're not talking about putting it in attributes or events, just putting it as the inner HTML data for, a, for an element, uh, like a paragraph or something. Okay, then if you encode it, then you can do it. Let's take a look at that encoding. <clears throat> Here's HTML encoding. It's basically you replace certain potentially problematic characters with an abbreviation that uh, HTML understands and will generally undo later on. So <clears throat> here are several uh, ampersands go to question mark AMP with a semicolon. The, uh... Yeah, so that's, and then the less than and greater than signs go to ampersand LT for less than, GT for greater than. The semicolon is important. The quote goes to quote. Now the single quote will generally go to APOS or apostrophe. Uh, although uh, one of the websites claims that that's not truly standard. And to be truly standard, you can give it a hexadecimal number. It turns out the quote is the uh, ASCII character hexadecimal 27. So that will do it. Okay. And so this uh, HTML encoding uh, will protect you in many cases, particularly if you're putting the data into the text of a paragraph or a table or something, but it's not sufficient for everything. Uh, there are, what else? Okay, there are other ways to sanitize. There are more advanced uh, cleaning methods that will allow certain tags to go through, such as, well, okay, the bold, the italics, the underlined, the emphasis, and the strong tags. Those change how information is displayed. Those tags can go through. In other words, if you had a really fancy uh, method that would check your input and say, well, okay, setting something bold isn't a problem. Of course, stop bold, you know, the, the versions that have the slashes, those are all okay. But script, that's not going to be allowed or, or the others, object embed and link. Nope, we're not going to allow those in input text. Uh, this requires uh, a much more advanced filter than simply character Replacement, character replacement is pretty easy to do. Uh, you have to parse the input to understand what these tags mean. Uh, Remember, of course, that you know it is a language. Hypertext uh, HTML is uh, hypertext markup language, and uh, there could be classes and other values in these tags as well. Okay, so uh, but that's doable. Uh, as long as your sanitation method works. If it doesn't work absolutely correctly, you can still be vulnerable. Okay, so that was rule one. Uh, so uh, here we have rule two. Now, say you're gonna take put user data and use it in an attribute, an attribute value. So uh, hopefully you'll all remember how attributes go and you can say, uh, you know, quote or bracket P 
uh, class equals the name that indicates uh, what class typically indicates how it's supposed to be displayed in CSS. That could be changed by user data, but only, only if you've encoded all the characters that are not alphanumeric. The letters and numbers are clean. Letters and numbers are safe. But anything that's not a letter or number, format it using the ampersand pound x and then the hexadecimal number representing that, that value. There are methods to do that, which I'll explain in just a minute. Uh, do not do this for other tags such as a hypertext reference, that's a link, or a source, or a style, or any of the other event handlers. But here's a list of safe attributes that you can change. If you look at these, an awful lot of them deal with uh, tables uh, and then the formatting of things. Um, all these are fine. You can change these with user data if and only if you have uh, encrypt or encoded it to remove all the non alphanumeric characters. Uh, and you need to have it encoded because people can break out of that quote. So we'll show that later on. Okay, so you need to encode these. Here's a couple of methods to do that. Uh, if you're doing this on the server, and remember, as we have learned earlier, you cannot trust the browser to clean everything and check all the uh, input validation because between the browser and the server, who knows what the user is doing? They may have a zap and changing everything. And so things may get changed uh, somewhere between. So yeah, if you're going to check something on the on the browser, that's good, particularly if you're going to display the information on the browser. But if you're just going to send it to the server, the server should not trust anything it got from the client, even if it thinks the client has already checked it for uh, to make sure that it's clean. And that is, again, another big source of errors where uh, a browser has very nice, careful JavaScript, make sure that nothing nasty gets through. And then using Zap or whatever uh, proxy system you have, uh, changes it so by the time it gets to the server, oh, it's not clean anymore. Okay, so if you need to uh, clean it up, you're going to do that on a server with PHP. A lot of servers I've run written run on PHP. There is a method HTML entities, and that does the encoding, and it will change all those characters like the less than symbol to ampersand lt semicolon. Semicolon is important, by the way. It has to be there. It doesn't work well. Uh, so it will do all that for you. And you can do it in JavaScript. There's the encode URI, passing it some sort of dirty string and it returns a nice clean string that's been entity encoded. Uh, and it will encode all non uh, alphanumeric characters, except for the list I show you here. The tilde, exclamation mark, blah, 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 question mark, plus all of these will remain as they are. Uh, and that's what code URI does. It's kind of necessary because the slashes are part of a uh, URI is universal resource uh, indicator, uh, very much like a URL, universal resource locator. And you need the slash because in the colons, you know, it goes HTTP colon slash slash. So you need the colons, you need the slash, so you can't encode those or the browser or uh, the web won't interpret. So you interpret the other things. Okay, but it gets all the other characters. You notice in particular, it gets less than and greater than science. So the start script and end script won't be fine. Uh, another function here, you encode URI component uh, is similar to encode URI, but it, it uh, will change all these symbols, except for the ones on the left, the ones in red, the tilde, exclamation point, star, parentheses, and the single quote, all of those are, remain as they are. The rest of them that you see on the right, all of those will be encoded into their, uh, the percent number value. Now you can undo this. If you encode something, because you wanna keep it safe, and later you wanna show it, you can, or for some reason, whatever it is that you want to undo the encoding, there's the decode URI component, and that will decode it, take it apart and put it back the way it was before you encode it. It's the opposite of the encode URI component function, just undoes that. Okay. 
uh, there is my system. Okay. Um, so uh, now that was rule two. Rule three for trying to keep your website safe is make sure you encode everything before you uh, put it into JavaScript. Yes, you can dynamically add JavaScript to your web page. The DOM, the uh, the domain object model allows you to add JavaScript, just like it allows you to add or change uh, web entities that appear on the page. Uh, so if you're going to do this, you make sure that you've encoded everything that's not a letter or a number uh, into the uh, numerical format. I have an example. This program, uh, Oh, this program adds JavaScript to the web page. And take a look at it here. You'll see, uh, again, we've got the input thing like before. We get the input. But this time, we're not going to just uh, write it to the web page. We're going to create a script element. Take the type as text.javascript. And then we're going to create a text node with that uh, input that we got. In other words, using the input that we got, make that into a text node and append that to the JavaScript. And then append that JavaScript to the whole uh, body of the document, to the website. All right, let's try running that one. Uh, there it is. Oh, it's still, that's big enough. Okay, so, uh, in this case, it wants to create JavaScript out of this. So we have to pass it some JavaScript. Uh, oh. Oh, there, I'm sorry. I'm hunting for my script examples. I have a bunch of examples. Don't want to have to type them in. Okay, so here, here is the sample JavaScript. Notice I don't have the bracket script and bracket end script on the ends because we already said in the that this is of type script. So I type this in and I press enter. Look at that, it runs. Uh, now, uh, let me type this in as, okay, I've got this version where I've uh, done the HTML entity encoding myself. And we enter that. Oh, uh, tell you what, let's just try resetting this thing. Now we'll enter that one. And now I'll press, oh, hmm. it's not working. Well, uh, I bet if we go control shift I, it'll tell us we have all sorts of errors. Oh, yes, look at that. Show name, don't do that. Okay, it doesn't like the ampersand. The ampersand just doesn't work there. Because again, it's trying to interpret this as script, so it doesn't like that. So that's just not going to work. Okay, uh, so skip that idea. Now, you okay? But you may be asking yourself, uh, why would anyone want to add JavaScript? Well, there's a lot of reasons. You can do lots of cool things if you run. Uh, you can dynamically add the JavaScript. You can get input from the server. And you know, add that. You know, if the server can give you a method that you need to run to do something, put that in your web page and add that, run that. Um, yes, yeah, so all these things can happen. Those of us with long gray beards who came up in a time of all languages were compiled, like C or Fortran or COBOL, uh, there wasn't anything like this because you know, you, you couldn't run. Well, of course, it was safe. You couldn't run your text because uh, the compiler had compiled long ago, and now we're just running the executable, and there's no way to execute the data. But now you can because everything's uh, being interpreted. JavaScript is basically interpreted like now the system may be a just in time compiler, so it looks like it's interpreting, but internally it's taking the source code and converting it to a format that it executes. Okay. So, of course, you might want to do this. Uh, on an innocent basis. So here's another possible website, or excuse me, well, yeah, website. Uh, 
I had very similar, but I've changed slightly where now uh, all I'm gonna do is when you get the user input, I'm not gonna, I don't assume that that's uh, some sort of JavaScript that I'm gonna execute. I'm just gonna put that string in my JavaScript. I'm gonna you know, quote it so it won't be it. So let's try running this one. Uh, Okay, there, there it is, and we're gonna make it big so you can read it. Oh, now you can. Okay, so we'll try type in uh, Fred again, and uh, it comes out Fred at the bottom. We can go Fred Jones, and there we are. We'll keep it up with the Joneses. Ah, so but now let's get mean. Let's type in our 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 tax script and. Nothing happens. Control Shift I. Console. No, nope, it just. Let's uh. Back up. Let's. We'll type in a name like uh, Fred, and then our attack. And all we get is Fred. In other words, it got the JavaScript, but it didn't interpret it. It put it in the element, but didn't interpret it. Because it was inside a quote, it thought of it as a character string. But that doesn't really protect you. I've got sneaky and I've got another bunch of input here. Uh, real quickly, let's go back and notice that we're going to just concatenate the user input between a quote and another quote. So it all appears quoted when you get, but I'm gonna put this string. Let's take a close look at this string. This string says anything junk, and then a single quote that matches the single quote that was in the code that we were concatenating the string together has a semicolon, ends the statement nicely. Remember, we are in JavaScript, and then has my alert statement with another semicolon. And then uh, I need there's another quote on the end. If we go back to here, you notice we're putting that string between a pair of single quotes. So I need to be able to make sure that that single quote on the end. Uh, Oh, well, I executed it. Yes, in this case, it did execute it uh, because that quote matches. This. So now this is perfectly valid. You know, it's gonna say var little x equals x quote, but, and then the quote. So in fact, this was run. And if you so put, put this here again, just as an example, so you can see it. Again, we are breaking out of the JavaScript and managing to run the uh, JavaScript anyway. So it's even though it looked initially like, oh, okay, this looks like a, a safe thing to do, put that in there so it doesn't. Uh... Now, uh, go back to the example. There it is. Uh, we'll refresh this just to make sure it's all clean. Try it again, but this time, uh, putting all the HTML encoding in myself. And what happens is it, it takes it as, it displays it as you want. It's, re, it's reversed all the encoding. So all the uh, ampersand quotes become quotes, the ampersand apostrophes become apostrophes and it displays it, but it doesn't execute it because it did not interpret the, uh, the, you know, the code here to be actually an alert. Okay, so there's my example. So, and again, so the rule was, don't put unencoded data in there. Uh, an extension of this rule, which uh, OWASP calls rule 3.1, is that uh, HTML, you should HTML encode anything you put in a JSON statement. In other words, you have JSON data going to and from the server, particularly if you're getting it from the server, do a json.parse so as you can put it back together. Also, if you're sending uh, JSON, tell the system that the content type is application slash JSON. Don't just let it default to text.html. This instructs the browser that you're getting JSON data and don't try to interpret it. Uh, another rule. Yes, I told you a bunch of rules. Uh, yes, XSS and CSS or cross site scripting and cascading style sheets. Yes, your cascading style sheets are also vulnerable. 
you can watch out for those and you can put styles inside the web page so it's very easy to append a style to your web page don't use untrusted data in a property value not even uh, or other places here's an example where we've added a background url and we put an alert in there so that will generate a javascript alert just by being in the cascading styles in the style not not changing the text of the web page and of course being very careful when you create links if you, in other words, if you're going to use and put data to a link, you're going to ask a user what's their favorite website, and then you're going to go take that website information, put it in a, a link, and go to it. Well, you got to be careful. Uh, if they haven't properly got now, in this case, you have to use encode URI. You can't use encode URI component because that's going to change the slashes and it needs the slashes and the colons and stuff. So just use encode URI. But before you do that, it's particularly useful to call the is valid URL uh, method. This is one of the validity uh, API methods. Call that to make sure it's a valid URL. There's one to check, by the way, for emails and several other things. This valid URL will tell you that yes. If it's not a valid URL, don't do it. So make sure, and then you can put it in there. Okay. Now. You're thinking, how are you going to send data to a network? In particular, we had that ex example where uh, Carol was sending send a link to Alice that contained an attack that would come back to her. Well, she's going to send the information to Alice's web. So how is she going to get there? The same origin policy might stop it because that prevents you from making a connection to a website that's not the same one. Well, you get around that because you can always access page uh, images. Say you have an image or uh, a lot of times I have websites that I'm using an image that I got from another website. Instead of copying that picture to my website, which looks like I'm plagiarizing, I simply link to their website. You don't recognize the difference. Uh, so, uh, so you can do that. So here's an example of an image request. And this is the source. So www.evil.com slash secret stuff. The secret stuff could be uh, the user's cookie. The uh, website you know, may not be really, you know, uh, we're not talking maybe Apache here, we're talking your own program uh, that's accessing the website. After all, WebGoat is a program that runs, that looks like a web browser, but it's not. Uh, so you can just have your program. And when you get a request for, for, for that, you can just save whatever the secret stuff was whatever and of course both cookies are base 64 encoded so it goes over the web very nicely you just save that information away and then send back whatever picture you think is appropriate uh, so the user will be happy uh, and therefore the uh, javascript can send information to any website it feels like just don't try to create a direct link you can send it off as a, a website and of course even if it's a standard uh, web server, if the if uh, logging is on, whenever you make a request for a website, it logs it uh, and it stores it in the log, tells you what page you tried to request, and it will send back a 404 file not found if you're using, you know, Apache or Internet Information Server or something. But then you go back later on, you can look in the log, or Carol can look in her log and say, oh, they tried to get this. Look at that interesting page. That's the that's the information I wanted. Okay. So uh, cross-site scripting is a big problem. If you saw earlier that about 45% of the sites had it, it happens a lot. Uh, it's basically because the browser is insecure by design. Yes, they designed it so that you could dynamically load JavaScript into it and run that, but that causes all sorts of problems. Sometimes I think people say, oh, this is a cool feature to add. And you got to tell them, maybe it's not. Uh, and of course, you can turn off JavaScript. Uh, there's a, a option in your browser, uh, at least in Edge and Internet Explorer. I haven't found it in Chrome, but maybe it says, turn off JavaScript. The thing is, once you turn off JavaScript, ah, nothing works. So I, that's an overkill. So that's it for cross-site scripting. Uh, I would like you to go out to WebGoat, 
run WebGoat again, and do all the exercises in A7 cross-site scripting. Uh, don't bother putting one blackboard, uh, but uh, you'll know a lot more about cross-site scripting if you do that. Otherwise, uh, just listen to me, what are you gonna learn? Okay, any questions about cross-site scripting? Uh, if not, don't, don't run away yet. I am not done. Uh, we are going to uh, want to cover one more topic here, one, one maybe two more topics. Uh, I want to talk about the suggestions I got uh, on the first assignment or the, the, well, on the metric quiz hack assignment. The last question uh, worth 10% of the problem was tell me how to protect it. I got lots of interesting ideas, a whole bunch of which don't work. And I thought I'd go over some of these that don't work and explain why it probably doesn't work very well. Okay, so here's some, here's some ideas that seem reasonable at first. You think, yeah, that seems like a good idea, but actually it doesn't work. Okay, HTTPS. HTTPS is the secure version of HTTP and it encrypts what goes over the website. Uh, well, I haven't covered it very much, uh, but Zap handles HTTPS just fine. Uh, you may have to answer a question on the browser saying, hey, this doesn't have the proper uh, certificate. Do you want to accept it? And you just say yes. Uh, it starts off if you just load that certificate into your system, the Zap certificate, and it works. It just goes right through. Also, remember, there were a couple ways to do that attack, one of which was to use the debugger. If you're going to encrypt it, well, yeah, but you, to use the debugger, you're going to change the data before it's encrypted. So that doesn't do any good. Somebody said, well, put JavaScript in there to stop it. Well, I'm not sure what the JavaScript would do. Remember, the whole quiz is run by JavaScript. I don't know if you looked at the page. It's just a JavaScript uh, program. Uh, somebody said, don't let people post more than once. Um, you're allowed to take the quiz as often as you like. I reason I added this is because it's not uncommon for people when looking at a, a security problem and coming up with a solution that does in fact solve the problem. Unfortunately, it also prevents people from doing what they're supposed to do at the website. Uh, so this is one of the solutions that actually doesn't solve the problem, but it does stop you from doing what you're supposed to be able to do at the website. So, and that's not uncommon when people come up with cool security solutions. Uh, a couple of people said, hey, let's put a password. Make you have to log into the system. You notice you just have to put your name. There's no password requirement. Uh, well, let's think about that for a minute. Uh, if there was a password, you're a student in the class and you're supposed to take the quiz. Now you're supposed to get a score no better than 100, but you want to get a really good score. Uh, so uh, you would have a password. I would have to give you a password to use the system. So you'd have a password. And the fact that you could access the system, which you can, and you got a score of better than 100, in the case the password wouldn't have done any good. Uh, here's a couple of interesting solutions. Uh, uh, they, are, they don't work, but they're, they are interesting. Um, so, oh, darn. Uh, okay. Uh, you could encrypt the JavaScript. The, uh, okay, well, that was the suggestion. Unfortunately, you can't encrypt the JavaScript because the browser has to be able to read the JavaScript. When it gets down to the website, your browser has to be able to read it if it's encrypted and it won't be able to read it. Also, of course, remember that uh, there's a zap attack. There's changing the data as it comes out of the browser and encrypting the JavaScript wouldn't do that. Uh, now, you can't encrypt the JavaScript because the browser has to read it, but you can obfuscate it. Uh, hang on for a second. Uh, okay, let's try this question, thinking about obfuscation. Please click.
Okay. It's not a hard question. Uh, it may take some soul searching. It makes it difficult, but do your best. Okay, anybody else? Uh, oh, got another one. Okay, there's one person who has an answer. You know, there's always somebody who's falling asleep. Oh, 100%, cool beans. Okay, let's take a look at this. So, uh, well, looking at the bottom two, a vague understanding and uh, obfuscation is a big word. I don't know, you know what is that? Uh, that's 74% uh, of the users say, uh, not really. all right. So in that case, I was prepared, as you might expect. Uh, so stand by. Uh, and we're going to, uh, do, 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 uh, look at obfuscation. This will just take a minute or two. It's pretty short. Uh, OK. Well, what is this obfuscation? It's messing up the program in some manner, making some transforms, changing the way you wrote it into a perfectly valid program that still calculates the same results, but doing it in a way that makes it so weird and it's difficult to understand. Now, uh, I have been teaching Comp 163 for years. A couple of you have taken me in Comp 163. That's the first Java program. I can tell you, a lot of freshmen obfuscate their programs pretty well. They make them as confusing as I can possibly understand. Okay, but uh, so why did we do this? Because uh, nowadays, again, we have lots of interpreted language, JavaScript, Python, uh, and even, even Java, which is uh, compiled, but you send the class files. There's all sorts of programs that can re uh, un dis disassemble or uncompile the class files back to the Java language so they can see the source code. So you have to send the source code with, in order to execute it on the client system. So you're sending the source code around. A lot of companies spent a lot of trouble making their uh, source code. And they don't really like the idea of sending it out with everybody uh, so that everyone can see the source code. So they try to make it, so they scramble it up in a way, they obfuscate it so that it still works, but it doesn't look very good. It's hard to understand. Uh, I might also point out that obfuscation can be used to hide malicious code. In other words, if you're gonna put some sort of nasty stuff in uh, source code, you'd like to put it there in some way that the users aren't gonna immediately spot it if they happen to look at the code. Obfuscation does that. And there are several websites and tools and stuff to do obfuscation for you. Uh, I have an example uh, of a manual do it myself. So here's a simple Java program. Uh, you can obviously get Java or JavaScript. I just happen to pick Java. This is a simple program. It doesn't do much. It takes the as an input parameter cat to this method. It uh, multiplies it by four, passes it, sets dog to that, that sees it's that greater than five. Actually, that's pretty dumb because unless that was what, well, never ignore the, the logic. <laughs> well, yes, but never mind that issue. Uh, then it says if dog is greater than five, we're going to set cow to seven, else we're going to set cow to eight, and we'll return cow. Okay, pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, first couple weeks of uh, freshman programming. That's it. Here's the same function. It runs the same way, but it isn't nearly as understandable. We still got a public study for it. Clear same method. All the variables we had, my favorite dogs and cats uh, and cows, they were all changed to variable names like V1, V2. Uh, we even lost V3. Uh, we did a little what we call constant propagation. In other words, we didn't really need that many variables. We got by with fewer variables. And the most favorite thing for obfuscators is whenever you have an if, we have a if statement here, where we have an if else, it changes it into the inline logic statement where you have a logical statement uh, followed by a question mark. If this is true, it does this, else it does that. Uh, and then it returns that value, which is in the return statement. So it returns, what does it return? Well, now what is this here? Arrow, arrow, that's going to take variable one, which by the way happens to be the parameter previously known as cat, and shift it left two bits. Why would you want to do that? 
Because if you take an integer and you shift it left two bits, it's the same thing as multiplying it by four. Every time you shift it to the left by one bit, it multiplies by two. Doing it by two bits is multiplies it by four. So in fact, this is gonna multiply variable one by four. Yes, trying to make it as confusing as we can and then seeing if that is less than equal to. We flipped the logic of this just to be weird. It was greater than five and now it's less than or equal to five, the opposite way. Anyway, and I initialized one variable to seven. And so it's gonna return the seven or plus plus that it's gonna add one to seven becomes eight, which was the other answer. So that's the obfuscated program. And that's basically what obfuscation does. It changes a nice, clear, easy to understand program into something I might get from a freshman. Okay, so that's obfuscation. Anybody have any questions about obfuscation? Except how to spell it? That's not an answer I'm going to give today. Uh, okay, so uh, that was an interesting idea. It doesn't quite work uh, because, well, first of all, Obfuscation doesn't really work. Obfuscation, uh, the program can still run. Therefore, you can still analyze it. There are all sorts of programs that will unobfuscate things and undo all the nastiness, and makes it look a lot nicer. Um, of course, obfuscation has other downsides. It makes it pretty darn difficult to debug. If it doesn't work, uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, and so, it still runs. People can still run the debugger on it. They can still trap the information with Zap. So while it does make it more difficult, it doesn't work. So that's these are interesting ideas that doesn't work. How do you how do you solve the problem? Well, there are several good ideas. One is that there are only twenty questions. The server, when it gets the results, should not accept answers with more than twenty correct. That, of course, you know, if you get more than twenty correct. It's, mm, Somebody's cheating here, and that would be a good way. Another way is to change the program so that instead of creating the questions on the client side with the JavaScript, create the questions on the server. And the server then sends the questions to the client, which displays the questions. The answers are sent back to the server, which keeps track of how many you got right until you answer all 20. And then the server keeps track of the time, the server keeps track of everything, all the client does, is display the questions that the server sent and sends back the answer. That uh, was, is an effective solution. Speaking of solutions, uh, you should have handed in the sensitive data exposure problem by now. If you did the problem, then you know why I have this picture. If you didn't do the problem, you're like, what the heck is he talking about? Uh, okay. Uh, any questions about any of this material? None right now. Okay, but if you come up with another one later on, you know, if somehow I've fooled you, uh, then send me uh, an email or a text message and we'll see what we can do to fix it. So I'd like you to work on that WebGoat, the cross-site scripting materials WebGoat. I'm not gonna make it, oh, I wanna, yes, there's another poll, hang on. We are going to do another poll, please. Uh, Please answer this one. Just a little music while you're at. Okay, I got about five more people need to respond. I know you're out there. I even know you were awake a few minutes ago. So. Okay, ah, one person hasn't quite woken up yet. So turn it off and show everybody the results. So as you can see here, 39%, uh, which is not a majority, but 39% of you got it less than half an hour, 17% uh, took less than an hour. So if you add those together, uh, you get what, 56% of you got it in less than an hour. A couple of people took uh, more, uh, less than two hours. Uh, that but about, a th what is that, 28% of you took you more than two hours or you never did it, uh, never got it done as a, now, never got it done, 
I'm not exactly sure if that means uh, uh, whether everybody, uh, sorry, just looking at it, whether you didn't try it or you tried it, you tried it and tried it and just couldn't get it to work. Uh, if that's the case, if you tried it and couldn't get it to work, well, talk to me. Let's that's we we can meet. Uh, nobody so far has requested Zoom office hours, so I haven't been doing that. I know, oh, about a quarter of you prefer I have regularly scheduled office hours, which I have not regularly scheduled, but I'm waiting for people to actually have a question. So uh, since nobody has any questions, I'm not going to have any office hours until you do. But if you have a question, send me an email, send me a text, set up smoke signals, and we'll see if we can't get together and solve some problems. All right. Well, that's it for today. Uh, yeah, no assignment. Do the stuff on WebGoat or not. I won't know. Uh, but uh, when it comes to test time, you'll know. Uh, so that's it for today. And uh, I do have a couple other uh, pre-recorded stuff coming out uh, in a day or two. I've got some of it already written. I just have to narrate it. Uh, and we're we have in the past talked about encryption and we talked about private key encryption in the pre-recorded material and public key encryption and certificates. Uh, and we're gonna talk about SSL and TSL. Those are the uh, secure socket layers, the transport socket, sec transport security layer. Uh, that's how it sends things back and forth in a secure way. Basically, it's how does HTTPS work? And I'm going to go over that in some detail so you know just how that works, because that is a major piece of trying to secure the system. All right. So see you in a week sooner if you have questions. Bye. See you later, Dr. Williams. Thank you, Doctor. Have a good day. Have a good one. Thank you. Stay healthy. You do the same. Yeah, I got vaccinated. One of the advantages of being old. That's great. <laughs> Have a good week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Bye.